All right, I'm going to cut this short. How many of y'all believe I can cut a 30-minute sermon into 15 minutes? Are y'all kind of wishful thinking? Or? The kingdom of God is advancing forcefully. I'm going to try to do this as short as I can, but I hope we can, we can put a link to see things this morning more from God's perspective than just from our perspective. If I ask you the question this morning, who's winning? Is God winning or is Satan winning? What would you say? Okay, y'all are good Christian people, but if you ask most people that question, it looks like Satan's winning, doesn't it? I mean, we've established over the years that, that probably our best guess is the real number of Americans who are born again and saved and going to heaven is probably around 10% which means 90% are not. Because you either are or you ain't. Right? I'm sorry to all you English teachers. I just said it <laughs> I've been rebuked for that before, and I've tried to do better, but I'm still slipping into my old redneck ways every once in a while. But I was thinking this week, the kingdom of God has been advancing. You know, Jesus said the kingdom of God is advancing forcefully. And I was thinking about the kingdom of God here on earth has been here for a little over 2,000 years, right? How many people have been born again and saved in those 2,000 years? Now, we got different places on the earth. Some places uh, are is right for the gospel. You know, when Don Babbitt was here a few weeks ago and he talked about going to minister to the Maasai tribe in uh, Africa, and every time he goes, man, 1,000, 1,500 Maasai receive Christ as Lord and Savior. They're hungry. They're spiritually hungry. They've never heard the gospel. And so when it's brought over there and it's presented, they receive it. Now, if we go to North Korea, the ground in North Korea is pretty hard because it's illegal to preach the gospel in North Korea. And if they catch you doing it, even if... I read last week they caught somebody who, who left a Bible in a motel and they arrested him. And they're in prison right now for leaving a Bible behind. Uh, any of the Muslim countries, you know, it's against the law to preach the gospel. So that's really hard ground. If you go over there, you are risking your life. We've been praying for Pastor Saeed Abedini for two years. He's in an Iranian prison for preaching the gospel. <coughs> And, and we could go on and on with naming names of the ones we know, and how many do we not know? So there's good soil and there's bad soil, but the kingdom of God is advancing forcefully. Uh, I want to read just a few scriptures. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, it says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. In Luke chapter 4, verse 13, Jesus said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. In Mark chapter 4, verse 14, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. Paul said that the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. I, I was reading some notes in my NIV study Bible. It said the phrase, the kingdom of God is used four times in Matthew. The phrase, the kingdom of heaven, is used 33 times. And then Mark and Luke you, 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 use the name kingdom of God exclusively. The kingdom of God, listen to this, the kingdom of God is the reign of God that He brings through Jesus Christ. It is the establishment of God's reign the look God. It's the establishment of God's rule in the hearts and the lives of God's people. You get that? What is the kingdom of God? It's the establishment of God's rule in the hearts and lives of the people of God. 
That is the kingdom of God. So when Jesus said the kingdom of God is near you, what's he saying? I'm bringing it. And if you receive me, the kingdom of God will be in you. So this morning, this place is full of the kingdom of God. Can I get an amen? amen. Okay, so it's the establishment of God's rule in the hearts and lives of God's people. Listen to this. The overcoming of all the forces of evil. The removal from the world of all the consequences of sin. Including death and all that diminishes life. And the creation of a new order of righteousness and peace. The idea of God's kingdom is central to Jesus' teaching and it's mentioned 50 times in Matthew alone. The coming of Christ, who is the king, brings the kingdom to the people. When Jesus is talking about the kingdom, he's indicating changes needed to be made in civil government, religious teachings, and in personal behavior. Now what is the kingdom of God? How much is the kingdom of God in us? Because if I read that right, the kingdom of God is the, uh, to the same degree that the rule of God reigns in our hearts and in our lives. So we all know Christians are in different places. And there's probably a lot of people that we call Christians that are not Christians. Can I get an amen? Because what is a Christian? A Christian is not a fan of Jesus. In the United States of America, Jesus has lots of fans. But he doesn't have as many followers. Right? Those who are born again, those are the followers of Christ. Those are the ones who have given their lives to Jesus. And they're following him. Now you can have, the, the rule of God can reign in your heart, but maybe you're a baby. You don't, spiritually speaking, you don't know much about what that rule of God is. What does the rule of God reigning in our life mean? How much have you surrendered to God? How much have you given? This morning we saw three who were baptized. They surrendered their life to Christ, right? But, but what does that mean? When you surrender your life to Christ, oftentimes you don't know all that that means. But basically it means I'm letting go and I'm letting God. I want Jesus to rule in my heart. And you're going to have to work some things out. Because if you're 32 years old when you get saved, Jim, you've got a lot, you've got a lot of baggage you've been carrying with you, haven't you? And so what does Jesus do when He comes into your life and you've got all that baggage? What I've noticed is He does two things. Some things He just immediately delivers you from right there the moment you give your life to Him. And then some things He leaves for you to deal with. Jesus said, if you're going to follow Me, what? you got to you got to take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. If he delivered you from everything, there would be nothing for you to deny. But if we're going to follow Jesus, we've got to take up our cross, which means we've got to kill some things. You've got to kill your will. You've got to kill your fleshy desires. Because for Jesus to be ruler and to reign in your heart, you've given up what you want, and you want what God wants. Abraham Lincoln, I can't remember the exact quote, but I, I remember reading Abraham Lincoln saying one time, somebody asked him if he thought God was on his side. And he said, it's, it's not a question of is God on my side. He said, the question is, am I on God's side? Because God is always right. Right? And that's the way it is with us. We can be, we can be cross followers, but we can, we can be picky with the degree in which we are cross followers which is a big problem in the church in America. A lot of Christians want to be Christians when it's convenient for them, but they're not willing to pay a price. One of the things I saw on, on Facebook this week was it, it's, uh, it showed a picture of a big rough and tough guy that said, uh, a man who won't stand for anything is not much of a man. And I, and I thought, you know, that describes Christians. How much are we willing to stand for and how much are we just going to lay over and let the enemy have to run rush out in our lives? Most of the Christians that are going through really hard places, a lot of times it's because we have laid down and we are letting the enemy run rush out over our lives. Now maybe it's, maybe it's ignorance, maybe we don't know what to do. But listen, 
Ignorance is not an excuse. Can I get an amen? amen? Jesus has given us the answer, I believe, to every question that we will ever face in life. And so we cannot use ignorance as an excuse. Now, if we're ignorant, then we need to start doing something about it. We need to start feeding our spirit, man. And the best way I know to do that is to read your Bible. Read and study your Bible. Get it in you. And, and, and let your spirit man grow. When you, did you know when you come to church, you're allowing your spirit man to grow? A lot of times when we come to church, you can't measure what happened to you that day. You can't measure how much God ministered to you through the worship. You can't measure how much the Word of God ministers to you through the preaching of the Word. You can't measure how much the love of God has been administered to you through the saints. Can I get an amen? amen? So the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing. Sometimes it doesn't always look at, look like it, but can I tell you something this morning? The Bible says that, that God has seen the end from the beginning. You know what that means? It's hard for us to understand, like Jim was talking about, God is three in one. It's kind of hard for us to understand sometimes. But God doesn't live in time. We are, are living in time. We are trapped in a sense by time. We can't get out of time. The sun's going to go down tonight. And the sun's going to rise again in the morning. And another day is going to have passed, right? We can't get out of time. God is not in time. So what is going to happen, God has already seen. That's why we got the book of Revelation. He just told us what's going to happen. And so, no matter how bad things look, no matter how bad circumstances are in your life, or how bad circumstances are in our nation, we can know that God is working and all things are going to work out for His good. How many of y'all have read the story of Job? You know, the Bible says that Job was a righteous man. And evidently, God was proud of him. Because when Satan comes up to heaven, God asks him, where, where have you been? I've been roaming to and fro. Have you considered my servant Job? He's a righteous man, but not like him. What does Satan do? Well, who can't be righteous when you've got a hedge of protection around him like you do him? I can't touch him. You let me touch him, and he'll curse, curse you to your face. So God says, all right. You can touch him. You can touch everything but him. Don't hurt the person. Okay. You just see Satan leaving legally and eagerly. And he destroys everything that Job had. Killed all his kids. Stole all his riches. Left him there with nothing. Job falls down on his knees and says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. Did you do that? Did I do that? Job was a righteous man. <clears throat> And what I want you to see in that story is God had to allow Satan to do those things. Satan was prohibited from touching Job or his things because God had a hedge of protection. But when God releases those hedge of protections, what is he doing? Does that mean he doesn't love you anymore? Did he, did he love Job any less when he took those hedge of protections down? No, he was doing it for a purpose. And the end result of all that is Job became an even better man. And I want to tell you, when God does that with us, it's the same thing. He, 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 his tests and his trials are to make us better. His tests and his trials are to, he uses to conform us more into the image of Jesus. But we have to respond like Job responded for it to work. If we curse God, then we're no different than anybody else. Can you accept good from God? Can you accept bad from God? You know what Job said? How he told his wife, his wife said, Man, you need to give up your integrity. You just need to curse God and die. How many of y'all glad y'all ain't married to her? <laughs> I can't believe she said that. <laughs> but he, he didn't get into it. He said, I, I can't. Or how can we not accept bad from God when we accept good from God? And Job didn't understand everything, but he, he understood enough to know that he trusted God. How many of y'all understand enough this morning to trust God, no matter what you're going through? 
no matter yeah. how bad things look, no matter yeah. how bleak they are, you know enough that you can trust God. There is nothing like God's love for you. There's nothing like uh, the plans and the, and, the, and the things that God has for you. Now this morning, if you're sitting here, you're going through something, you, may, you probably think you're the only one. And we talked last week about Elijah, you know, Elijah when he stood at Mount Carmel and he's having a conversation with God, he really thought he was the only one left in all of it. Because that's what it looked like. But God said, dude, I got 7,000 that have found me in rest. You're not the only one. And so this morning, I'm going to tell you that same principle. If you are struggling, you're in a hard place, you are not the only one. Satan wants to make you think you're the only one. You're not the only one. God has a plan and a purpose that when you get through that thing, you're going to be better off. You're going to be a better person. You're going to be more like Jesus. I am so grateful that Don and Barbara are teaching this class on marriage for the next 12 weeks in Sunday school. And, you know, I've told you about mine and Mila's marriage. You know, the first two years we were so happily married. We never fought, argued, everything was doing, you know, lovey you. And then uh, she woke up at the end of two years. And, uh, and then we, we kind of had this power struggle. And years two through ten were pretty bad. Now, I'm still a Christian. I still love God. She's still a Christian. She still loves God. But we haven't learned how to work all these things out. And so sometimes I acted badly. A few times she acted badly. And, and there were times that we did not enjoy life. We did not enjoy very life. It was tough. But because we were both trying to serve God, we, we allowed God to work on us. And today, I can tell you with, with all assurity, I believe that I am the happiest married man on the planet. But, but we didn't get there overnight. And that's kind of the way the Christian life is. We don't get there overnight. You're not going to get born again and be a super Christian the next day. You're going to learn to walk in the footsteps of Jesus just like everybody who's gone before us has learned to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And that is primarily learning how to be obedient. It's primarily learning how to be obedient even when it costs you something. It cost Jesus his life to come and pay the penalty for our sins. And it's going to cost us something to follow him. I really get irritated with preachers who say, come follow Jesus and your life will be so much better. Can I tell you something? That's a lie from the pit of heaven. Your life is not going to be rosy because you make a decision to follow Jesus. But if you will follow him, your life will end up being so much more better. Of course, there's no greater reward than to belong to Jesus. This morning, before church, I sent out a tweet. <laughs> I'm trying to be, I'm trying to engage with the younger people, but I'm not very good at it. But I sent out a tweet, and, it, and I, all I said in the tweet was, join us tonight at 6 p.m. for I Stand Sunday. We cannot let the government we cannot render to the government what belongs to God. So I put it. And for some reason, you know, I don't have that many followers, so I wasn't expecting a response. And uh, but for some reason, I checked my phone about 15 minutes later, and I had been bombarded <laughs> by the homosexual community in Houston. So evidently, they got wind of the fact that they're having this I Stand Sunday in Houston, and so they got a army patrolling. If anybody, and I put hashtag, I stand Sunday. I stand Sunday. So apparently they're looking for that. I got my word. Now, and if some of it was pretty ugly and nasty stuff. And, you know, I thought, if that would have happened a few years ago, I would have got really pleasure. I'd have been ready to fight. But as I read those horrible tweets, my heart broke for thinking those people I don't think that they were being ugly just to be ugly. I think that's what they really believe. I think that's where they're at. And they think the church of God is their enemy. Now the church of God is the enemy. Who are we the enemy to? We're the enemy to Satan and his kingdom. But God's kingdom is forcefully advancing. 
And so when you, I, I'm saying all that to say that we have a real enemy. You have a real enemy. Your flesh is your enemy. The world is your enemy. And Satan is your enemy. And the world and Satan are getting pretty aggressive with their attacks on Christians. Christians are going to have to stand up and stand for the name of Jesus. You can't go through life in the world we live in. This is not your mother and daddy's world. This is not the world I was grew up in. The world I grew up in was pretty Christian friendly. Churches were honored and respected. Pastors were honored and respected. Today, churches and pastors are pretty well despised in the world that we live in. And Christians are pretty well despised in the world we live in. If you're going to follow Jesus in the United States of America in the year 2014, you better grow a backbone. You're going to have to stand. You're going to have to make some choices. But then not just that. I want you to also think about constantly planting seeds. Constantly planting those shade trees we talked about earlier. You may not ever get to sit in the shade of that shade tree that you planted. Did I say it wrong again? No. <laughs> Come on, careful. I got people watching. But somebody will. And so I want to encourage you today that the the the, the, let, the, 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 the things you do for God, even if you never see a physical result yourself, the things you do for God will last. The things you do for God will affect the kingdom. Don't get discouraged if you don't see immediate results. Uh, working for God is not always a short-term plan. Most of the time, it's a long-term plan. How, how long have I been planting seeds in your life? Ten years. It seemed like a long time to me, Alba, before you found me. Huh? Right? But somewhere, something clicked. And so when you're witnessing the people and you're planting seeds, it don't it may it may get frustrating. You may think they're never gonna get it. You just keep planting and keep watering. And you trust God to bring somebody else to plant water. Someday somebody's gonna read. Can I get an amen? Yeah. I'm gonna close with this story. How many of y'all have heard Matthew West's song Forgiveness? It's a great song. Last night I saw him in concert and he showed a video before he played the song and the video showed where he got the song from. He believes in the power of testimony and the, and the power of stories and so he started asking his fans to send him stories of their testimony. And so this one woman named Renee sent him her testimony. Her daughter had been killed by a drunk driver. And I don't know how long it was from the time of the accident until the time the guy went to trial, but the kid was a 24-year-old kid that killed her. And when, when they went to the trial, the, the boy broke down and he started crying and he said, you know, if I could trade places with her, I would. And you could tell he was really sincerely heartfelt, broken, you know. And she said, I knew that that was my moment. And so when he finished, then the family got a chance to speak to him. And as the mother, she went first and she went up and she hugged his neck and she said, I want you to know I forgive you. I can't imagine how hard that was to do. But she hugged him and she's crying and she said, I forgive you. And when she did that, 11 members of her family came up and did the same thing. Somebody's got to take the first one. Then the whole family went before the judge. He sentenced the guy to 22 years in prison for this manslaughter. The whole family went up to the judge and asked him to reduce his sentence. And the judge reduced his sentence to 11 years. Cut it down. And today, that young man is touring the country with the mother, telling their story of forgiveness. Every time they tell their story of forgiveness, you know what's happening? The kingdom of God is advancing. Every time you tell your story, the kingdom of God is advancing. Every time you witness, every time you water, every time you plant, the kingdom of God is advancing. Sometimes you can tell it, sometimes you can't. 
that you can trust the kingdom of God is advancing.